Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Today's show is sponsored by Sourcewell. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. We have a special guest today. He is a dear friend. He is a New York Times, Wall Street Journal bestselling author. He went to the U.S. Air Force Academy. He's a decorated combat veteran. He's a, just a, an amazing leader. He, uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit, but he's one of the guys I would say in our business because he's speaking all over the way. He's a Hall of Fame speaker. He's a guy that we would say is the same on stage and off stage. And I, I'm, I'm just grateful that he's friend. Welcome to the show, Lieutenant Colonel Waldo Waldman. You've got your MBA, you got it all, but uh, you're a leader of leaders. And I just want to say thanks for being on. You got it, David. Great to be here and happy new year. Happy new year. So there's a lot of things I could say about you, your family, your life uh, nowadays, but give us three things. Waldo, who are you? My background as a fighter pilot is one thing, but I was I was having a little sales call this afternoon, and I think more than ever, people want the raw, the real, who you are, the blood, not the muscle. And so, especially during COVID, when things have changed a lot, you really sit and become more insightful and more, more introspective about who you are, what drives you, what you believe in, what's your, what I call, you know, the true north, right? What gets you out of bed, not necessarily what keeps you up at night. And- I like to refer to myself as a courage monger, not a mm. fear monger, because Lord knows we see enough about that. I give people courage. I want to give people the courage to take their actions, to step out of their comfort zones, to ask for help, to be okay with where they're at, but not okay with, with their complacency. I am a performance expert. I teach people, and in particular, the most important wingman there is in my life, myself, how to take action every day and grow. So, hmm. so that's kind of what it is uh, as far as you know professionally and what I do. But I'm also a, a a proud father of a little little wingman named Ace who turns ten years old on Sunday, and then uh, my wife Dana, who's an amazing wingmate. So I love family. I love. I also love God. But that's a yep. whole other yep. story. You can share any of it here. It's a safe place, and we know. You know, trusted leaders generally they are they, they, they. There's a whole lot beyond their work. Those that are only focused on work usually aren't as great at work. One right. other thing that I think is really congruent with what you said. You know, we talk about trust, and I know you uh, a lot of what you believe about it. But, but we talk about how if you're doing leadership alone, you're doing it wrong. And you talk about being a wingman and what it takes and what it means. Tell me about that. So I think a, a wingman or a wingmam, mm -hmm. those that are the ladies who we fly with, are the type of people where others feel comfortable coming to for help. When you think about trust, and a wingman is a trusted partner. That's what I, I coined uh, 20 years ago when I started working. A wingman is a trusted partner in business and life. And how do you define that trust? And you're an expert in it, David, is are, do others feel comfortable coming to you for help? Are you an expert? Are you compassionate, empathetic? Are you courageous? Are you emulating the same things that you ask other people to do? And as a leader, if other people can come to you for help and they're confident that you can help them and not rip their lungs out or kick them in the knees or criticize them, then you're able to solve problems. And most companies that we work with are having problems with their people, not being able to come to their leaders with their problems and possibly some solutions to solve those problems. And that's the key. How do you solve the problems? How do you get your people to perform and grow and solve future problems? And also, obviously, help your clients. Because if you have a whole company of people where everyone's comfortable going to each other for help and solving each other's problems, and you build that culture from the inside out, guess what? Now your prospects are going to feel confident in coming to you for help because every wingman or wingmam on your team is giving, is service focused, is confident, 
And uh, that's how great companies flourish from the inside out and build great partners and revenue with their clients. I want to get to the book in a moment because it really follows this. But before I do, uh, you know, the y- y- you you think about this. Well, I mean, you should say the book title, New York Times bestseller, Never Fly Solo. But we see a lot of leaders. They have imposter syndrome. I've sat next to presidents of companies and presidents of countries, and they're scared to death they're going to be found out. Yep. They don't want to share who they are, what they're really about. They, they're, they're just in this. How do you, how do you, you're a leader. How do you show healthy vulnerability? How do you, how do you make an approachable environment where people, where you're, how do you get willing to ask for help? What do, what do you do with that to some of these people that, you know, we're sitting next to that are, whether it's ego or whatever in the way? Right, right. It's it's a great point, David. Uh, number one, and I'm going to share some specifics that I learned as a fighter pilot in the Air Force that I teach my clients, is is it, it starts with you, what I call the inner wingman, the person staring back at you when you put your flight suit on every morning. Do you trust yourself? Are you full of baloney? Are you putting in the time to refine your flight plan, to learn, to pivot? to demonstrate empathy and compassion and caring, to say, I need help, or I don't know, in front of your peers. Uh, To admit your mistakes, uh, 15 years ago, I worked for a title company in California at the big meeting, USA Today, came out with an article, front page of the paper, or in the business section, they made a a horrific sin. Uh, It made the news, it was not good, and guess what? People were reading it at the at the buffet that morning. And that CEO came up there and said, listen, we messed up. I'm sorry. Well, you know, we got to make this right, but there's no excuse. She was transparent. You know, look at what uh, what Tylenol did when they had that whole issue, Johnson & Johnson, right? You know, when they admitted their mistakes. So admitting your mistakes and showing your humanity and vulnerability is key. And it's not to say... If you're always admitting mistakes and always showing vulnerability and messing up, hey, probably not credible, probably not right. working on yourself. You probably need to go back into the hangar and the simulator and start working on your craft and technologies and tools and tech tactics. You got to be competent. Yeah. However, most leaders get to the position where they are there because they're competent. But now those soft skills are key. I'm going to share a quick example, David. Fighter pilots demonstrate acumen and teamwork and culture and growth through procedures called briefing and debriefing, right? So I'm gonna share a little bit about a debriefing. What we do at the beginning of a debriefing is number one, we take off our rank and our name tags because we don't wanna have our ego, i.e. our rank or our personalities, our name tags get in the way of growth. You're a number. If it's a four ship, it's one, two, three, four. No Joe, Mike, Lisa, and Sabrina. No, you are a number, right? And we are on on an equal playing field. But the first thing that happens in a debrief, Dave, and this is important for your listeners, is we go through the objectives, see if we hit them or not. And then the leader shares his or her mistakes. What did I do wrong? Here's what I did. You know, I called uh, tanks dry too early. I overgeed my jet. Look at the tapes here. It shows me calling a kill left-hand turn bandit at 22,000 feet. The pipper wasn't on. I messed up. Or I didn't call out the uh, the emergency airfields. What is that going to do, Dave, for the rest of those teammates, those young guns, maybe brand new to the squadron when it comes time for them to share? What are they going to do, Dave? You know the answer. They're going to share. They're going to share their mistakes and possibly and maybe uh, with a bit of reticence, the other mistakes that the leader may have missed. Well, sir, ma'am, you also uh, uh, got within 500 feet within that that turn and uh, you broke the bubble. It was a a standards violation. And also uh, A, B, and C, well, okay. Now, hopefully the wingman, the, the, the young folks on the on the team or the other folks aren't calling out too many of those mistakes because once again, it will interfere with the credibility of that leader. But you want to create that culture and the gloves are off, the smoke's coming out of nostrils and we go deep. But guess what? When it's done, we're professional. We move on, salute smartly and get, grab a cup of coffee or a beer and uh, move on with our day. 
Hey, it's Anne with the Trust Edge team here. As you know, we are passionate about helping you and your team perform at your best. And that's why David wrote his new book, Trusted Leader. This true-to-life parable follows the story of a CEO who uncovers the root issue threatening his organization's success. And in the back half of the book, David provides a roadmap for even how to solve those root issues. Get Trusted Leader for your team, your organization, or even just for yourself at trustedleaderbook.com. Creating psychological safety. I mean, people are talking about it all over the place. You know, we just, I, I gave a briefing on, I just actually, it's still on my table. I wasn't going to show this, but the, the trust outlook for the year. This is our re- annual research. We put out one of the more significant studies around trust and leadership every year. But there's there's a big, uh, this this really, this research has pointed to this fact that you're bringing up of, of, of this tension between vulnerability and accountability. Right. And so it, it basically, I mean, in a simple form, we know that uh, some people say, oh, transparency, 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 and transparency is trusted, but so is confidentiality. And there's a tension there, and you're kind of talking about it too with it, how much it it's, it's takes wisdom, it takes effort, because we have to be confidential about some things. We, As leaders, we have to be transparent about some things. Some people are so transparent, I don't trust them for a second on Facebook, for example. But, you know, how we have, but we also have to create spaces in our leadership and our teams, you know, with our wingmen where we can be fully transparent. Almost the more transparent you are in that close team, the more trust, right? And, so, and, and, and Yeah. And, and the transparency means if you create a standards violation or a or an infraction on the culture of integrity, accountability, service, courage, whatever it is, uh, you have to be so transparent that you're not going to treat one person differently than the other. If you create a safety violation or break the standards of a squadron, you will be heard from, you will be debriefed. We need to do it with tact and with empathy and compassion, but also sternly and also with the fact that if you continue to break these violations, we are so transparent in this organization. I am so transparent as a leader that guess what? You can lose your wings. We have fighter pilots who continuously break the rules. I've seen great guys become sloppy, complacent, uh, committing moral violations in and out of the squadron. And guess what? Those wings are gone and you cannot tolerate that. So don't think transparency and vulnerability is, uh, is only you know, just to show, you know, you know, your, your built nurture relationship. Sometimes you as a leader have to get rid of that relationship or that, that resource, that human resource that may be dragging down the culture of an organization, as you know, as well as me, Dave, if you have somebody who's committing those trust violations and they are not uh, given that feedback and action not taken to them, it's going to spread like a virus within that organization. And we need to maintain those standards and, uh, stick to them consistently, not just with certain peers and coworkers or supervisors, but with everyone. So I remember critical. the first time I learned that a little bit, you know, I'm working with this organization and there's there's nine directors and a vice president over them. And eight of those directors are fantastic. The ninth one is a sloth, terrible, unaccountable, you know, sloppy, lazy, everything else. But who did everybody hate? Who did these other eight directors hate? They didn't hate the sloth. They hated the the vice president that didn't deal with it, that didn't hold accountability, that didn't, you know, deal with the situation, right? So it's it's interesting as a leader that that balance and absolutely true. So I'm gonna jump over and let's go to my wingman here today. Uh, you got a question for us? Yeah, uh, I was wondering since you were talking about the importance of you know accountability, also vulnerability, but be able to create that safe space. What if there's a leader? who maybe it's their um, board or uh, some group that they're over and they realize it's not like a safe space, that people aren't communicating well, they're you know, not being transparent or vulnerable. How does a leader create that environment so that other people can feel safe to be able to share, to be able to actually help the team be better? Well, you also want to reward and highlight the person who is sharing their infractions who is demonstrating integrity, which doesn't only mean saying, uh, you know, being honest. It means being honest about being dishonest. We're all going to make mistakes. We're going to say things that aren't, that, that may be under the gun and under pressure aren't true. We may fudge. We may do something that we regret. And being able to create an environment where folks admit their mistakes and are not necessarily rewarded, but highlighted for being congruent. Let me share a quick story. 
I over g a jet. I made a struck. I structurally damaged a plane when I was flying, not because it was a, uh, it, it, it was intentional. I was hot dogging. I over g the jet in the traffic pattern, broke the 6.67 G limit and knew I committed a safety violation because I was trying to test the limit. This was early in my career. It wasn't a safety hazard where I was avoiding a bird or an aircraft and I over g the jet. Now, it's a big deal when you over g the jet because you have to impound it, inspect it. It has to do with safety. And so when my commander found out that I did it because I was messing around in the traffic pattern, he chewed me out, ripped me apart, used foul language. Man, I was horrified. And I had had a perfect record up to that point. And so he made me brief the rest of the squadron. Uh, this was in the early 90s. I had a uh, acetate overhead projector with magic markers and all that stuff. Remember, you know, for the, <laughs> the old farts on, on the call know this. And uh, I was so embarrassed. And my buddy came up to me at lunch and said, Waldo, man, you, I, I feel for you, dude. Um, man, how you doing? I said, my reputation in the squadron is toast. My commander hates me. I'm never going to go anywhere here. And he said, you're probably right, man. He just, just brutalized you. <clears throat> and he said something that I'll never forget. He said, Waldo, you know what I would do? If I over G'd the jet, by the way, by 0.3 G's, it was hardly anything. I had to maintain my integrity and turn myself in because I could have punched off the G meter and nobody would have known. It was like a stopwatch, but I knew it wasn't the right thing to do. He said, if that were me and I over G'd it by 0.3 G's, I'm punching off the G meter, zeroed it out. And I'm not saying anything because I don't want to have to go through what you just went through. Hmm. And it pissed me off because I knew deep down that instead of creating a culture of accountability and courage and support through my commander's actions, he was in instead creating cowards mm -hmm. and people who wouldn't uh, share their infraction. So what he could have done, maybe I'll ask you and, and Dave, what do you think he could have done to shift the energy in the room with 180 of my peers? What could he have done to make it different? I don't know, maybe if he had shared, if he had ever done that or something and kind of build that kind of credibility with them saying like, it's not like it's a unique thing. Like I've done this too. Yeah. Yeah. Share something that he messed up. Right. Uh, Dave, any other thought as well? I'm going to come. Well, you know, this is, a, it's, it's really interesting. I, if you can't, I mean, this is whenever I think about this with my own kids, like if you, if you um, push them too much, it's like we're embarrassed that then you're almost pushing them to make a to tell a lie instead of tell the truth, right? Did right. you do that thing? I mean, this could go all the way to did you do your homework? Yep, I'm done. Did you brush your teeth? Yep, I'm done because you know they're going to get kind of slaughtered because they didn't brush their teeth. If that happens, obviously you create an unsafe environment for even even that little little idea. So, um, tell us what do you think? So, so what he could have done. And what I've seen done with other commanders, it has to go with that, that title company that, that was mentioned in the USA Today story. Number one, did I deserve to be reprimanded and punished, guys? Yes or no? Yes. I did. You're absolutely right, David. I committed a safety violation and I cost the Air Force $25,000 because that's what it would cost to fix that jet and do an inspection. Plus, plus some, if there was indeed cracks in the airframe. So I needed to be punished. But what if Colonel Starworth said, hey, Waldo, or a team, Lieutenant or Captain Waldman, back then I was gotten messed up. He committed a safety violation, over g an asset, an aircraft uh, uh, that our taxpayers have paid for. He is grounded until that plane is fixed. And if any one of you do the same thing, you're going to be grounded too. However, I also want you to note that Captain Waldman turned himself in when he only over g that jet by 0.3 G's, which probably 99.999% of the thing would, wouldn't have meant anything. He maintained his integrity and his acceptance of responsibilities for his actions. That's the type of leader I want in my squadron. That's the type of fighter pilot I want to fly with. And that's the type of action I want to see every one of you do. And congratulations, Captain Waldman. I appreciate your honesty. Now finish your briefing, right? Whoa, oh, now, now you're shifting the culture. Now I trust Colonel Starworth's judgment. And his name is Charles W. Starworth III. He was a butthead. I didn't respect him. He's in my book. And I didn't appreciate how he made me feel for a year. And I, I will not forget and forgive, <clears throat> in many ways, a leader who violates that trust 
and, and diminishes and humiliates somebody else. And by the way, if it happens more than a few times, you're out of the squadron, you're out of the Air Force, the wings go away. But we have to be careful as leaders, cutting off the knees of our teammates, our coworkers, our new hires. When they, when they admit their mistakes, we need, to, we need to nurture them. We need to punish them in some way, give feedback, move them into another position, get them remedial training, and a worst case scenario, fire them. But we need to coach them up and inspire them because as General George Patton once said, as a leader, you're always on parade. Indeed. They're watching you in and out of the office, at the Starbucks, at the public supermarket, in your briefings. And you need congruence and consistency and transparency to maintain the high standards that you have as a leader and that your company has uh, as an organization. And General Patton, if I remember my history well, you know, was it would say I'm going to be the first to cross the river, not the last. I'm yep. not going behind. I'm going in front. Right? I'll take the bullet. You got it. You got it. So, so let's jump over to to personal. You know, a lot of leaders, they have, uh, you know, when we talk about being trusted leaders, they seem to have some great habits or routines personally. Tell us about some of your, what makes you, you're, you're leading a great company. In many cases, you're coaching, consulting, and advising great leaders around the world. Right. And, uh, you know, that's fun to collaborate on and, and uh, uh, in our friendship. But how are you leading you? The, it, the leadership starts with the person staring back at you. I mentioned that before. I call it the inner wing man or the inner wing ma'am. You know, do you trust yourself? Do you feel competent, courageous? Do you feel worthy of the wins that you want? And many of us have this cognitive dissonance. There's a disconnect between what we want and what we're even teaching and what we're representing in our lives and our actions outside of the cockpit, away from the teammates, out of your uniform. And so I have to have confidence in myself on this call and when I coach executives and do my programs to say, I am preaching because I'm doing the hard work. I, for example, you know, today I always work on myself. I read something spiritual in the morning. It sets my vector. It's the context of the day. You know, I ease my mind. I, I did a med meditation for 23 minutes today. Uh, it's an ah meditation, the creation sound, um, learning new things. I'm getting uncomfortable with this meditation stuff, but uh, I'm learning and I'm becoming more present. So I did the meditation and then I did uh, I ran for like 25 minutes and stretched, listened to a podcast, fed my mind with good positive ideas and nourishment and came up with some ideas. I'm like, wow, now I'm energized, right? And so, uh, and then uh, I had some oatmeal with some blueberries. You saw me chopping it down before we did our thing here. I wanted to give myself, I'm, I'm, I'm watching my diet. I, I'm pretty lean. I'm pretty muscular and fit, but I I've got body by brownie from the holidays, right? So I've gained a couple pounds. I want to lean up. And guess what? When I'm putting in the work, when I'm getting my mindset right, when I'm doing the disciplines that emulate excellence and build trust in myself, it's going to be translated and transferred through this medium called a camera talking to you a thousand miles away. And it's also going to be translated to the people that are watching me on stage, getting coaching from me, et cetera. And people smell out and feel dissonance. They sense somebody that's not worthy of trust. I don't care how charismatic or good looking or sharp you think you are. People sense it. And now more than ever, they feel it on a phone call, on a, on a Zoom call, and on a stage. So you've got to be no doubt. have that sense of confidence and you can't put your fingers on it. But so I go through those habits and practices. And also, I'm pretty good at asking for help. I know, man, I could be a wing nut at times. I've got issues and challenges. Uh, I'm always working on myself, but I have a bunch of friends and peers who I can go to for help who will kick my butt you know, be my wingman and tell me what I need to hear and not what I want to hear. So I think that's important. And I have a saying, and I, I want people to write this down. It's one of my favorite quotes I made up is make your friends, your mentors and your mentors, your friends. You've got some mentors, right? 
you've got some people who are, who are amazing in your life up there in Minnesota. And, uh, and, and, you know, when you, when you make them your friends and uh, make your friends, your mentors, now you're talking about building that team of wingmen, those men and women who are competent and capable and empathetic and compassionate enough and willing to tick you off to get David to grow. And so I'll tell you this, this, this can't be, can't be uh, overstated. You know, <clears throat> mentors, uh, mentorship has changed me for sure, but I'll go back to the mentors that became friends. So 28 years ago, about in college, I started meeting with a group of guys Thursday nights, 10 o'clock till midnight, we would meet. How are you, you know, with real call outs to how are you being great? How are you treating that woman on a date? How are you leading this way? How, we were kind of no, you know, leaders on campus, some would say, but that group still meets every year. Now we don't meet every week. We meet every year for four or five days, little cabin up in the woods, and we each share about three hours each through a wow. series of questions. How you living as a dad? How you living as a leader? We we all lead teams or companies. How right. are you? And that what I've seen is great leaders are willing to not just take feedback but seek it. And that's I think what your your group when you talk about your wingmen and wing mams, um, you know, willing to seek. It's different than just take feedback because you can deal with the omen. Oh, they gave me some feedback. I got to deal with that. I got to manage it. No, they're seeking feedback right. and seeking oh, yeah. to be better. So. I think, and I think that the other thing that I want to call out here and what you said, we say it all the time here, it's every science says it, and I've said it before, input leads out, equals output, right? Business, input equals output. First law of thermodynamics, the energy put in is the energy get out. Psychology, what you think about, you start to desire, what you start to act on. I mean, every science says the same thing. I can eat something bad and it comes in bad, <laughs> becomes bad output, whether it's a brownie right. body or not, right? So, um, but I've always appreciated that with you, your discipline, um, both as a husband and a father with your body. I mean, I, I can't, you know, this is hard to say, but people that actually, we do trust those um, that that kind of, you know, that are disciplined in other areas. I mean, because you're disciplined with your body and with your uh, parenting, people trust you on the stage, even though it's you're talking about something totally differently. Right. Right. So never fly solo. What what inspired what what inspired that book? So it, it's about those partnerships, right? It's about nurturing those relationships in your life that can get you to the next level, that humble you, that make life more joyful and less fearful. You know, when I flew in combat and you know flying an eight hour mission over Iraq at night and being shot at is one thing, but then I suffered with claustrophobia. I had a panic attack. Uh, scuba diving three years of my 11 year flying career it developed through PTSD uh, this 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 anxiety that I had for eight of my 11 year flying career and I had people help me I doubled down on what I was fighting for who needed me one of my tools and I could talk about this for a long time but I'll just share when I have those panic attacks in the jet the biggest tool to allow me to overcome my fear, and stay present was looking out my wing or to the student sitting next to me, because I was a teaching as well. I was an instructor pilot and focusing on him or her saying, this person needs me to teach them. They need me to take them into Iraq on a seven hour night combat mission. I could be freaking out having this claustrophobic mental panic attack, but I distracted myself from myself and focused on that teammate who needed me and also who I knew had my back, who I knew was checking my blind spot, my six, you know, in a jet, you can't see your most vulnerable position behind you. If you're leaking fuel or on fire, et cetera. But when that wingman or wingman is there and you feel confident that you can depend on them and they can depend on you, you have a higher calling. And that's why part of excellence is service. And Love is service in action. When you truly love something and serve them and distract yourself from your fears and realize there are men and women who need you, and this is key right now in the, in the, in the, in the COVID environment and our environment of, of instability and uncertainty and turbulence, you have to distract yourself from yourself. And what a better way, no better way to do that than to think about those people who need you and any parent, any loved someone who truly loves somebody else. I'm talking about true, authentic love. 
will realize that you'll jump off a hundred foot diving board to save your kids and jump in front of a train and take one for, for your loved one. It's no longer about you. And so this was, was key. And that's what never fly solo is about. Uh, and, and realizing in my life, I would not be here if it wasn't for those teammates. It wasn't for my friends who encouraged me, coached me, kicked me at times and pushed me. Uh, and so that's, that's what my context of life is about and all my speeches and my coaching. It's about trusting yourself, which is the first part of the book, and then trusting your team. You've got to build those partners because you can't see the big picture on your own. There's others who have a different insight, experience, and context of success. And you got to put it in your flight plan to grow. Hey, it's Sam from the Trust Edge team. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root issue hindering your organization. And that's where Trust Edge coaching certification comes in. Trust Edge coaches are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results in a culture where people actually want to make an impact. So whether you're a coach with your own clients, or a leader training people inside your organization, check out trustedgecoaching.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your business. And now back to the show. Maybe we get to something specific, I love this. You know, we just came through a crisis. People could say there's racial tension, there's global tension, there's political tension, and of course there's been pandemic tension. But how do you, you take, you know, these, these flights over Iraq, and we're talking about trust, we think trust affects every part of a leader more than anything else. How do you build trust in the midst of combat, in the midst of tension and challenge? How do you build trust as a leader then? So you, you build it by experiencing that fear and anxiety and pressure as much as you can so that by the, when it happens the next time, you're more present. Here's what I mean. You, when I was in combat for the first time, I was scared to death, crapping in my pants, so to speak, walking on the tarmac, heart pounding, freaking out a bunch of times. I'll never forget crossing the forward edge of the battle area in combat for the first time. You go master arm hot, you hit the pickle button, something's coming off that aircraft. But guess what? People are trying to kill you. Think about that. You are in an area where people are trying to kill you. The fear is overwhelming. But guess what? You get used to it. And the next mission gets a little easier and you engage the enemy and you realize, hey, I can operate in this environment. I can operate and lead my team and feel confident in getting the job done. I'm building my skill set. I'm building more courage. I'm building more confidence in myself, which will then allow me to take bigger risks and stay in the fight more and coach others more. So that is the foundation of resilience. Resilience just doesn't mean I'm going to meditate. I'm going to call a friend. I'm going to have a green smoothie and do yoga and and maybe take a walk in the park. Those are important parts of distracting yourself from the current fear. But true resilience for a warrior, for a leader who's in the battle every day, risking it all, risking getting shot at, facing their panic attacks, is being used to and getting used to operating in that danger zone. And you're just going there. And that's why I have a saying, pain leads to peace. Pain leads to peace. That pain of staying in the jet, being shot at and overcoming, the pain of being on that treadmill like I was today, you know, doing the high intensity training and going up to like nine, nine, you know, nine on the thing and sweating and doing that 45 or 60 seconds. So I wanted to pass out and then slowing it down. I'm like, okay, I'm used to that. Guess what? That pain now builds the endorphins. And I have peace because guess what, listener? I did it. I stayed in that, on that treadmill. I bled and sweat and I went through the pain. And I'm building that resilience and confidence that only is a byproduct of risking it and stepping in the ring and, and, and facing your fears. That's the gift, by the way, of the pandemic. That's the gift when, God forbid, you get COVID and you go through the, the rigmaroles and God willing, you live. That's the gift of maybe having your spouse come up to you and say, I want a divorce and working through that. That's the gift of 
embarrassing yourself in front of a sale because you weren't prepared and you lost a deal and you have to go home uh, with your tail between your leg. That pain will lead to peace as long as you learn from it and are willing to continuously step into the jet and face those fears. And that's why the best leaders are the ones who have the experience and the scars and the battle damage to prove it. Well, there's a whole lot more here. There's a whole lot more in Never Fly Solo and all the all the uh, resources, and we're going to put them in the show notes, and I'm going to ask for them in a second. Well, we should jump right here. Where, where would you say, where can people go to find out more about Never Fly Solo, all the great work you do, and Waldo Waldman? If you go to yourwingman.com, yourwingman.com, and actually, I'm going to give everybody a free download to my New York Times bestseller, my audio book, and we could track it. Uh, based on your listeners, if they go to yourwingman.com forward slash NFS, like never fly solo, yourwingman.com forward slash NFS, you get a download of the audio book um, and share it with your kids and people who uh, who, who need that courage. Uh, and if you go to Walter Waldman on LinkedIn, that's where I'm really, really do a lot of work. Walter Waldman uh, on LinkedIn or Google Walter Waldman, you can find me there. I'm all over social media. And so that's the, the best way to find me. And I'm actually going to put it up here on the screen. If people want to connect with me, if they're watching this, there's a link to uh, Never Fly Solo. And there's a QR code. If you put your camera up to that, press pause on this video and you can connect with me on LinkedIn right there. So let's get the lightning round. This is fantastic. What uh, a, cu- a couple quick things here. What's your favorite book or resource right now? So uh, I'm, I'm reading uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People again. It's just such a fundamental, critical book on communication skills, on relationship skills, on business. It's just amazing. I actually had my son read a chapter the other day. I'm forcing him to read more. It, it's just so great. And then uh, uh, Ernest Holmes, uh, he, he's a spiritual leader. Uh, he's got a, he's got 365 philosophies to every day. So I read that every day, and that's that's my go-to because it gets me thinking in the right direction. Perfect. Good. I mean, how to win friends and influence people. That that book's changed a few people's lives, hasn't it? I remember. Yep. I think I was eleven years old or something when I read it for the first time. Good for you. Good for What's you. What's your? Um, give us one tip. Parenting tip. You've got a great ten year old, uh, great marriage. One parenting or marriage tip. Make sure there's consistency between your husband or sp- spouse or partner uh, with how you you handle and discipline your son or daughter. Uh, you don't correct your husband or, or partner or, or spouse while they're doing something. Uh, if, if, the, if your son or daughter does something and you see your spouse or partner make a, make a decision, hopefully that's supporting how you feel about it, but don't correct them in front of each other. Make sure there's consistency. Otherwise, your son or daughter will doubt you and they won't know who to trust. Absolutely. Don't... Consistency is key. Yep, it is. It's a culture of home, critical, right? What, what's one thing left for you on the bucket list? So I, I think I need to go. I need to go uh, uh, parachuting. I, 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 most people don't know I'm massively also afraid of heights. I was claustrophobic and afraid of heights. <laughs> I, I need to jump out of a plane before I die and face my fear. Now, I did go scuba diving again a few years after that other incident. It was in the Caribbean great training. I was in a cage initially and they coached me. Great. Important to have people you trust to face your fears. If you're having an anxiety, those instructors were phenomenal. Um, But I got to jump out of a plane. That's that's on my fear bucket list. Uh, (laughs) So uh, don't please don't hold me accountable. Yeah, sure. Waldo. There you go. So I'm going to make that happen uh, uh, with my twin brother, Dave. We're going to both do it at the same time. And I'm going to, you know, face my fear and do it. I'll tell you what. Um, this some, many don't know this about me, but I uh, I had an incident. I used to be a lifeguard, you know, growing up, and uh, um, had my lifeguarding and all that. And I was caught under a big, more than a tarp. It was an inch thick of black bu- bubble rubber under a big spans of water. Anyway, I should have died. And that, but that moment, 20 years old, that made me claustrophobic. And I, I really learned it the first time when we went spelunking or caving. And I thought, oh. Oh, what happened? But, but it was uh, that, I don't know how you get in those 
you know, pl- I mean, I, you gave a tip today on focusing on others, but it would be massively difficult for me. I've had a challenge. And I say, you know, flying 100 times a year or whatever, a couple hundred times, I guess, round trip. Um, people don't pay me to fly. They pay me to get on the plane. And, and you know, when everybody, if, if I'm inside and everybody stands up, I sort of, ugh, I, I uh, have had to learn to, to manage that as well. But my dad was a paratrooper. And so this is kind of a fun connection for you. And so I did go up and, uh, you know, parachute. And that was a great experience. And uh, I think you should do it. Um, but uh, yeah, they are. They are kind of opposites. But, the, you know, one is being totally free and, and, and high uh, uh, up in the air. And the other one is being totally con- uh, put in a tight space. But uh, yeah, both yeah. valid fears for sure. Afraid of heights. Let me share something real quick here. Um, and it goes back to, you know, one of the tools of facing my fear uh, was, you know, reaching out to my team and, re- and realizing that and focusing on them. But it also is a line, and this is critical for the listeners, and it's critical for a leader who have, have other people depending on them. It's critical for a wing mom, a wing dad, who has a spouse, a partner, or children depending on them. It's called responsibility. I had wings on my chest, David, and listeners. I had rank on my shoulders. I was a fighter pilot. And when I was asked to go to battle, it meant it was incumbent upon me to face my fears because others were depending on me. When you're a parent, if you have little ones at home, you don't say, oh, I'm losing my passion today. I'm just a little afraid. I'm losing my passion. Listen to your old daughter or son. Hannah, listen, I'm losing the passion. Uh, Why don't you change your diaper and feed yourself some Gerber? And I'm going to go have a, have a Chardonnay and call it a day because guess what? My passion just isn't there. Too bad. I told myself, Waldo Waldman, you're a fighter pilot. You rose your right hand. You're Mr. Fighter Pilot Top Gun. You've got these wings on your chest. You better do the damn job. My ego was in the way and it helped me in a good way. But my sense of responsibility, which is in alignment with my honor as a leader, and that others were dependent on me, got my butt in that jet and made me take off. Because if I didn't fly, if I quit, if I wasn't present on the mission, who would suffer? Not just me, my team. We have a responsibility for our team. We have a responsibility to take care of our kids. We have a responsibility to live up to the standards that we preach about. And too many people today in society are focusing too much on their passion and on their joy and fun and forgetting that sometimes being a leader is going to suck and we need to double down on those responsibilities and grind it out and hopefully celebrate our wins. But because life is tough and sometimes it's combat. And uh, I'm just passionate about that now, especially with what's going on in the world today. Yeah. It is work to be a leader. The weight of leadership is heavy, but it is a, it's a massive responsibility. And I appreciate what you said. We, I couldn't agree more. We need leaders. Leaders are responsible. Um, so you know where to get everything, listeners. Trustedleadershow.com. Last question for you, Lieutenant Colonel. Here it is. It's the Trusted Leader Show. Who is a leader you trust and why? I, I love my twin brother, Dave, and he's my best friend. He, he's brutally honest with me, and I'm brutally honest with him. And I know at the end of the day, he is going to have my back and tell me once again what I need to hear and not what I want to hear. We have have a long relationship. We've always been very competitive with each other, but we love each other. He's the only person I I jump in front of a train for other than my family, but the only person I probably push in front of one because he drives me crazy, right? And for, <laughs> for those of us who have sp- uh, kids and uh, our uh, brothers and sisters that way, but Dave is my ultimate wingman. I know no matter what, 24-7, if I call out for help, he will be there for me. And he will give me the advice that I need to hear and not what I want to hear. And I'm blessed to have that in my life. It's a context of my life. I learned it. We were not just wingmen. We were womb mates, womb mates, right? <laughs> and uh, and so I'm blessed to have that in my life. And uh, he, he is my best friend. And uh, once again, he's going to piss me off sometimes. But that's who I want in my formation in combat. Somebody who's really going to have my back and help me to get better. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Waldo Waldman, 
Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for sharing with us. Thanks for what you do in the world. I, you know, I'm not, I don't say this trightly, you know, we're friends and I am so proud of you and so grateful for you and all you do, like I said, on stage and off. And uh, there are so many more nuggets we could dig for today, but I, I'll, I'll just wrap with some of these. You can sense dissonance in others. You got to reward or call out the good. You got to be willing to be uh, call, ask for help. Remember, input does equal output. Pain can lead to peace. That's a good one. Make your friends your mentors and your mentors your friends. Big question, do you trust yourself? You need to do the little things every day so you can trust yourself. And with that, I want to say a huge, huge, huge thank you. Thank you to all the listeners for listening to the Trusted Leader Show. We'll see you next time. Stay trusted.